All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 500 Days Countdown press briefing by the organizers of the Gay Games 2022. Before we start, we would like to share with you our teaser video for the games, which will give you a good idea of the mission and the values of the games. So please, Brian. Um, today, we're very pleased to have our three representatives here on the panel today. So in turn, they are Mr. Dennis Phillipse, founder and co-chair of the Gay Games 2022. Mr. Dennis Phillipse. And then we have Ms. Lisa Lam, co-chair of the Gay Games 2022. And last but not least, we have Professor Sun Yu Tong, who is the Assistant Professor of the Gender Studies Program and Founding Director of the Sexualities Research Program at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Welcome to everybody, everybody here. So first of all, we would like to invite Mr. Dennis Phillips to give us an update on the games so far. So over to you. Great, thank you for the introduction, David. And uh, good morning, afternoon, uh, good evening, depends where you are uh, on the planet. We have a couple of people joining via the Zoom webinar as well. So uh, thank you for joining uh, us here. So we're gonna talk about the gay games Hong Kong today, but we also want to give a little bit of a history so everybody knows what the gay games is exactly. Let's first look at our purpose. The purpose of the Gay Games is bringing diverse groups of people from all around the world and then together and then using sports, arts and culture, the community, but also some fun to create, mo to create great moments of fun. It, we believe that the Gay Games in Hong Kong will create a unique experience and a long lasting uh, impact in Hong Kong, Asia and the rest of the world. Our tagline is unity in diversity, because we really believe in the universal power of sports, arts, and culture. The Gay Games started in 1982. It was founded by an Olympian, Dr. Tom Waddell. He was an openly gay man and participated in the Olympic Games in 1968 in Mexico. Walking to the tunnels into the opening stadium was an amazing experience for him being applauded by thousands and thousands of people, he said, this is a feeling I want to give everybody. So then he had the idea to organize a big sport event. Initially, he called it the Gay Olympics. But two months before the event, the event um, was, uh, the, they got sued by the Olympic Committee for using the word Olympic. And last minute, he changed it into the Gay Games. And the idea, what he said was really the goal of the Gay Games is to emancipate LGBTQ people around the world uh, by educating people to sports, arts, and culture, uh, and using that as a great, great, a great experience for everybody. The Gay Games are held since then every four years all around the world. Most of the times in North America, a couple of times in Europe, and one time in, in uh, close nearby in Sydney, 2002. The event was held in New York, Chicago, um, Amsterdam, and in Paris last time. On the left-hand side, you can see the graphs of participants and where they come from. You can see that the blue represents people coming from North America, and orange represents people for coming from Europe. In red, it indicates people coming from Asia. Because the Gay Games was always held far away from Asia, for lots of participants from Asia, it was quite far and too expensive to come to the Gay Games. So we really believe that the Gay Games in, in Asia, for the first time, will attract thousands and thousands of participants from Asia. 
on the left hand side or right hand side, you can see also a woman. Um, anybody knows who this woman is? She's Tina Turner. And she was the guest of star during the opening ceremony of the first gay games in San Francisco. Next slide. The gay games principles are participation, inclusion, and personal best. Everybody is welcome to participate in the gay games, regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity, race, disability, and age. The only requirement for the gay games is that you are 18 years of older. Um, and there is no pre-qualification required. So everybody can join the gay games. So once we open our registration, you go to our website, register, and you're able to participate. By using these principles, we are able to organize the most inclusive sports event ever held in Hong Kong. The Federation of Gay Games is the governing body. It's a bit like the IOC. And the Federation of Gay Games is responsible for selecting every four years the host city. The Federation of Gay Games has six mem 60 member organizations, which are LGBTQ sports organizations all around the world, who will organize their sports events during the gay games in Hong Kong. For example, there's a wrestling group, there's a sailing group, a running group, a tennis group. So for all the sports, we work closely together with these member organizations to organize this event. In 2014, the opening speech was done by Barack Obama. And even Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton that time the Secretary of State, gave a speech to uh, welcome all the thousands of participants coming to Cleveland in the United States that time. The Gay Games in Paris, which was the last event uh, of the Gay Games, um, were heavily supported by the French government and the, 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 French mayor, the Paris mayor, because they really wanted to use this event to promote Paris as a safe and inclusive city. As you probably know, the next, next Summer Olympics will take place in 2024 in Paris. So they really use this as a playbook to create a safe event there. The event was attended by more than 10,000 participants. Um, and uh, we also had many participants coming from Hong Kong and China who really wanted to learn more about the gay games. We created a video about these gay games, which we're going to show to you now. So let's play the video. Oh. There's one more slide, sorry. <laughs> so what is exactly Gay Games Hong Kong? So Gay Games Hong Kong is going to be nine days multi-sports events with arts and culture and ceremonies. It's going to be the biggest multi-sports event, actually, because we're expecting 12,000 participants, 75,000 spectators. And during the event, we need 3,000 volunteers to organize these events. This, the, the Gay Games are organized by the community our commercial partners and uh, individuals. Everybody is welcome to participate at the Gay Games in Hong Kong, regardless of your sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, and age. The only minimum requirement is that you're 18 years of older. Um, we have been working very closely from the beginning, uh, from the bid stage five years ago with the Hong Kong government, and we're grateful for the support from different departments, including the Equal Opportunities Commission, Hong Kong Tourism Board and Invest Hong Kong. Um, we are a, just a charity organization based in Hong Kong, and at the moment, more than 180 professional volunteers are working and organizing this event. Sure. And let's play the video.
wonderful to see so many people gather together for sport. Bali is a very romantic, very beautiful city. It's good for our team. We have strict people, we have gay people. People are very warm and welcoming. I just feel at home. People should be more tolerant and more acceptable. Diversity, because that's what makes us human. And you're all invited for the next Gay Games in 2022 in Hong Kong. Gay Games is much more than the sport. It's more the community. In this place, I will talk to Hong Kong and the It will open the eyes of everyone. In 2022, the 11th year, it will be the Hong Kong Gay Games. Hello! See you in Hong Kong! Well, uh, okay, well, thanks uh, for showing the video, Dennis. I hope you all get a good sense of how the Gay Games was like in Paris. Now, coming back to Hong Kong, uh, what is it going to be like? Firstly, the Gay Games is going to have five components with an opening ceremony, which is going to be held at the uh, Hong, Kong Olymp uh, Hong Kong Stadium. So imagine the stadium filled with all the spectators and you are a participant marching in through the tunnels and emerging into the field with the crowds cheering on you. You're really gonna feel like an Olympian, right? And then also we're gonna have short speeches as well as performances by local international celebrities and artists uh, kickstarting the uh, beginning of the week long festival. Uh, next slide. So the Gay Games is basically a sport events, of course. So we're gonna have 36 sports uh, during next year. And to highlight the features of Hong Kong, we are introducing some new sports uh, specific to the games. They are dragon boat racing, trail running, e-sports, as well as dodgeball. All these sports events are gonna be uh, organized by the National Sports Association, as well as uh, events organizer in Hong Kong in conjunction with the uh, International Sports Association under the Federation of Gay Games. Uh, next slide, please. So the third component is the Festival Village, right? This is the place where everyone's gonna gather together before and after the sports events and just hang out, have some fun. We're gonna have daily arts and culture performances. There's gonna be food and beverage booths and the, you know, our sponsors booth, that sort of thing. And then, you know, imagine, right? After a game of tennis, you know, Dan's and I are gonna go have a drink. And, you know, it'll be really, you know, that's where you can, the heart of the festival, where people are gonna make friends, right? And then uh, next slide, please. And then the fourth component is the Arts and Culture Festival. As I mentioned earlier, uh, there will be daily performances at the Festival Village, uh, as well as uh, we are working with various local and national arts association, uh, which are gonna be hosting offsite uh, arts exhibition around town, including uh, locations like the Dai Gun in Hong Kong. In addition, we are also working with third party organizers to uh, do entertainment shows, you know, like junk boat trips or cabaret, line dances, to show and welcome all the visitors coming to Hong Kong, you know, the unique local culture and history. So the final component of the Gay Games is the uh, closing ceremony that will be held at the Festival Village. And it's really, really a part, you know, uh, for us to thank all the participants and volunteers, you know, for the week long celebrations. And it's also gonna be the official flag handover to the next host city in 2026. So next slide, please. So what's the impact of the community? And I think that was a little bit in part touched upon by uh, Professor Swin earlier. Uh, of course, for many, many participants, particularly those that are coming from Asia, this is gonna be a first time for them to partake in a global LGBTQ friendly event, uh, multi-sports event in Hong Kong, right? Now, Asia, has two thirds of the world's population. And if we say about five or 6% of them are LGBTQ plus uh, individuals, that's roughly translate to 293 million individuals. And in Hong Kong alone, you're talking about 481,000 people. So for all these individuals, being able to come to the gay games 
be open about themselves and celebrating diversity, playing sports and arts and culture is going to be really giving them a sense of belonging, a sense of community. And, and it will be a very, very good for the well-being of uh, a lot of the LGBTQ uh, population in Hong Kong and Asia. Now, from a general public uh, side, you know, of course, through the participating in sports, arts and culture, you know, they will be also bringing diverse group of people, whether you are, you know, allies or friends and, and LGBTQ, we're all going to be together being unified by sports, arts and culture. And it is only through that that we'll be able to get to know each other, promote a dialogue and break down stereotypes. And ultimately, that's what we are talking about is to promote diversity and inclusion in Hong Kong in a society. And then of course, on an individual level, whether you are as a volunteer or as a participant, you know, being able to be part of this world-class event once in a lifetime is gonna be a very, very empowering experience for you. I can say for, say for myself, I don't, I don't even play sports, but I am already very empowered, you know, through volunteering in the last few years. Um, next, next part. Okay. So in terms of the impact on the city, uh, on the economic level, I mean, this is going to be the largest multi-sports international arts and culture event ever held in Hong Kong. And we estimate based on previous games, uh, the economic impact study, it's going to be 1 billion Hong Kong dollars uh, local economy benefit generated, as well as 300,000 room hotel bookings. And you can imagine with 12,000 participants, 75,000 spectators coming in, there's going to be a lot of hashtag Hong Kong photos posted on social medias. It's going to be really, really good for the tourism industry uh, that have suffered quite a bit in the last few years. And then at the same time, you know, it's going to also position Hong Kong as a destination of choice for international sporting events going forward, because Hong Kong is these big, nice, world-class venues for sports facility as well as infrastructure. You know, being able to host the event to show to the world that we can do it is going to really help uh, position Hong Kong in the future. Uh, next slide. So next, I'm going to give you a little bit of a status update as to you know where we are at in terms of the planning process. Uh, next slide. So this is the key milestone. You'll see that in April, we actually launched our pre-registration as well as the funding support program, which I'll explain a little bit more later. And then today, we are very, very happy here to announce our 500 day countdown. From now until next November, you're gonna see us having more and more events and campaigns. We might be in your neighborhood, so stay tuned and watch for us. And then in the summer, you know, pending our ability to secure the venues, we would like to open registration sometime in the next few months before September. And then in November, we're going to have the one year countdown. And, uh, and then starting in January, we're going to recruit 3000 volunteers to help with the on site event and preparing everyone to welcome the gay games in November 2022. Next slide, please. Now this is about pre registration funding support program. We launched a pre-registration about you know, six to eight weeks ago, and I'm very, very happy to say that within these few weeks, we already have over 1,100 people pre-register. Now of that, there are 46 countries and region, uh, about 60% of them coming from North America and Europe, uh, about 27% coming from Asia, including Hong Kong, and then the 11% from the rest of the world. And that number is growing. Uh, in terms of the funding support program, that is really a program we have set up to help to make sure people who might need support financially to be able to join the gay games. So there are two parts to it. One is a crowdfunding platform that will work with individual participants to help them build up their crowdfunding page and then you know, help them fundraise to come to the games. And another part of it is a fee waiver program. We we're very, very fortunate to receive a grant from a private donor who uh, who let us set up this program, which will mean that for young people between the age of 18 to 25 in Hong Kong, Macau, mainland China, Taiwan, and a lot of the ASEAN countries will be able to come to the games uh, for the fee waiver so they don't have to really pay uh, any of the participation fee. At the same time, this program is also available for all the domestic helpers in Hong Kong, as well as uh, people who have filed for non refoulement claims or status in Hong Kong. Uh, next slide, please. Now, in terms of venues, I mentioned earlier that uh, we are going to have 56 locations all over Hong Kong uh, for the event, and 21 of them has already been confirmed with the private uh, association and clubs. 
For the remaining 35, we have ongoing discussions with the government to facilitate how we can do uh, priority booking arrangements for large-scale multi-sports events like the Gay Games. Now, I'll give you a little bit of context. Um, some of you may have heard uh, a few weeks ago in the electrical Q&A session, right? For Section 88 charitable organization, we are able to book the venues three to six months in advance. And then for National Sports Association, they're able to book it one year in advance. Now, um, while we do have the support of many, many National Sports Association, we come to a little bit of a tricky situation when we ask them to book the venues in their name for the gay games, which is not an event that is hosted by them. You know, there's a lot of technical and logistical issues. And that is where we would like to work with LCSD to see whether there's any flexibility to enable GGHK uh, gay games to be able to book these venues one year in advance so that we can open the registration in the summer. Next slide, please. So finally, on our little slide here, uh, we are very, very proud to have a, a very growing list of our supporters. And we have the Hong Kong Tourism Board, Invest Hong Kong, uh, Information Service Department, Brand Hong Kong, as well as the Equal Opportunities, Equal Opportunities Commission as our supporting organization from the government side. On the commercial side, we have uh, Merit Bonvoy and YouTube have signed up confirmed as platinum sponsors. And then we also have a lot of community partners and trade organization. And on the educational sector, we also have two of the largest universities in Hong Kong, being the Hong Kong U as well as CU, where Professor Sun is from, uh, signing up as a formal uh, supporting organization. And this list is growing, and we are going to be working really hard to broaden our supporter base uh, going forward. Next slide. Uh, so this is uh, the end of our presentation, and I will hand it back to David. Thank you, Lisa. So I think uh, before we move on to the Q&A, we'd like to ask Professor Sun perhaps to add a few more remarks to your earlier Comments as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll do the remarks in English in case you need to quote in Chinese. I can also do it later. So um, I, I am uh, Yu Tong Sun. I'm an assistant professor um, of the Gender Studies program and also uh, founding director of the Sexualities Research Program at CUHK. You may wonder why um, uh, I'm here as a professor, not an athlete, um, when, when, when I'm uh, here in the Gay Games press conference, because I think it's very important to put what we are talking about uh, in context here, especially given that there has been a lot of social debate on the Gay Games in the last month. As I mentioned earlier, I think um, uh, one question that people ask is, why is there a need for gay games? Why is there not uh, straight games, for example? Um, my uh, answer is similar to what I talked about earlier, is because in sports settings, there has traditionally been a lot of homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia, often linked to um, a, a, a culture of toxic masculinity that can be found in sports that makes a lot of gender and sexual minorities feel very uh, uncomfortable or actually have received either um, blatant forms of discrimination or negative treatment or more uh, micro forms of microaggression, say slurs or uh, so-called jokes that are being made at them. And we see that from international studies that um, especially among male athletes that has been um, uh, uh, pretty prevalent as a phenomenon. It is not to say that uh, there hasn't been changed that you would see that there has been um, in a lot of situations more openly LGBT plus athletes that have come out of the closet and that's met with pretty warm reception from uh, um, uh, uh, their fans or their industries. But still, that kind of homophobia or biphobia or transphobia in sports is something that needs to be tackled because it has real consequences on many levels. For professional LGBTQ plus athletes, it can mean that their relationship with their fellow teammates with the coach is seriously hindered and when you are an athlete who's worried whether people in your team would treat you in a way as an equal person then you might be uh, diverting your energy from playing your best at sports to hiding yourself which obviously you can understand in an ultra competitive environment that would very much uh, affect your performance but we're also talking about lgbt plus kids 
that who are being worried that when they join the PE classes that they might be bullied by other students. And then in fact, later on, that affect how they think about their own body, about their own uh, 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 self-image. And so the origin of the gay games is actually both to allow LGBT plus people to feel safer in this environment where they can be themselves to excel in um, uh, the sports field as any other persons. And at the same time, as Dennis and Lisa mentioned, that it allows the public more greater chance to be in touch with gender and sexual minorities who have largely been invisibilized in society. But nonetheless, actually research shows that the number is not as small as what people might have imagined. So I think there is a very important need to reorientate the debate uh, to that it is actually about inclusion, diversity, and health and well-being. And it is something that I don't think uh, many people can object to as an objective, uh, as an event. And then I will also just add a few points to what uh, Dennis and Lisa have already mentioned in terms of uh, the significance of the uh, event at different levels. I think the first most obvious, um, uh, well, there would be four aspects that I would talk about in terms of its impact impact to the LGBT plus community, to the general public, um, to businesses, as well as uh, what I would also like to see um, the government and the Hong Kong society to uh, support the event, to enable it uh, uh, to happen. The first one is, it's very obvious that uh, it would bring uh, a positive impact to the LGBT plus community. As I mentioned earlier, it makes uh, our LGBT plus athletes to feel more welcomed. But I think I would also like to point out that although the uh, games is called Gay Games uh, 11 Hong Kong 2020, uh, 2022, but as uh, Dennis and Lisa have already mentioned, this is actually an international uh, event and actually it has got international significance. So when now at 2021, um, we're talking about, we have got about 30 countries around the world that have legalized same-sex marriage. Still in many other parts of the world, being gay can mean that you can be subjected to different types of penalties. So to have this event actually is also of significance to the international LGBT plus community uh, in addition to the local LGBT plus community as well. And the second point about the general public, I think that uh, we have already mentioned that uh, it is perhaps not surprising that there is a theory called, called, called the contact theory, that when the general public are more in touch with different minoritized groups, then they are more uh, likely to understand what they're going through and then later on develop more positive attitudes to uh, the minoritized group. So I think the gay games would allow the general public to understand that when we are talking about LGBT, plus people. These are not theoretical concepts. These are people actually who are living in the same Hong Kong as they do, who are around them, who actually are like any other personnel that who are also um, are engaged in sports, engaged in education, engaged in employment, and then face sometimes very mundane issues as they also do as well. And then I think the third point, as Dennis and Lisa have already mentioned, is the business impact that uh, is going to bring to Hong Kong. As I mentioned earlier, I think this is also especially interesting, given that we're in Pride Month, that we see businesses, not only uh, multinational corporations, but also local uh, uh, companies that are increasingly LGBT plus inclusive, because increasingly that they realize that this is not only a good thing to do, but this actually makes great business sense, both in in terms of their own uh, uh, internally, it makes their LGBT employees more um, uh, 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 loyal, more productive, but it also means that they can also attract more LGBT plus uh, uh, talents uh, and also LGBT plus customers to their organizations. And the final point that I want to make is, um, I would like to urge uh, both uh, Hong Kong government as well as other uh, relevant organizations to make it, um, to, to enhance the running of uh, the gay games. Oh, is it working or have I pressed anything? Just keep going. Yeah, I'll just keep going. And then um, I, I would urge both the Hong Kong government as well as other organizations to um, support the gay games, to um, uh, make it 
um, even more smooth and even better prepared for its running. Because as I mentioned that this is not only about the gay games, this is actually about uh, the whole city. So I think in addition to enabling the booking of the venues, I think another thing both for relevant uh, government units as well as other service providers in society to think about and in preparation of the 500 day countdown is how to be LGBT plus friendly when we're going to have such a significant number of participants from uh, different parts of the world. So in the past, we understand that when transgender people uh, went through the customs, sometimes they experienced issues. So that would be something that the relevant units that could uh, look into training and awareness raising. And then also, I would also urge service providers like hotels or other service providers, if they see it as an opportunity that uh, they would like to take up, there's also a lot of preparedness that they need to look at in terms of how to make um, uh, uh, Hong Kong be a welcoming city for the many uh, uh, thousands of people who are going to join us from different parts of the world. So uh, these are a few uh, remarks and my thoughts. And so I hand the time back to David. Thank you very much, Thank Professor you. Soon. Thank you very much, Dennis and Lisa. So now we'd like to open up the floor to more questions from our friends in the press. Who would like to go first? So let me just repeat the questions in English. Uh, so the first question was around, uh, so this is the first time that the games are being organized in Asia. What has the opposition been in previous games held outside of Asia in other countries? And as we lead up to the games themselves, do you anticipate that there will be growing opposition among the community in Hong Kong? The third question was around, what are your views on the support for transgender communities in Hong Kong in terms of facilities, and perhaps also uh, community acceptance. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, I forgot what the last question was, but maybe Prof Professor Sun can remind me. Uh, whether Hong Kong has the facilities? No, that's no that was trans. So what was the last question? The venue. The venue, the venue. Oh, the venue. yes, the venue, venue updates. What are the private <laughs> venues that are already confirmed? Private venue. What are those venues? Um, so can I suggest maybe Dennis can take the first question? Yeah, that's no, right. So you can talk yeah. about the venues as well. OK, so thank you for asking your question. The microphone stopped working somehow, so I'll talk louder. Um, when the gay game started in 1982, and I think that time also the United States was, was still a, a different world than the United States was now, right? So for lots of people, the gay games or the gay Olympics at that time was quite a new concept. And, and when the gay games was held all, all around the world, every time there were people from different parts of the community who had questions and maybe concerns about why the gay games are needed and what's the impact. Um, like for example, in the last gay games in Paris, there were different organizations who said, do we need an event like this? Is it really required? Um, and also on, on the journey within the last five years of organizing the gay games in, in, in Hong Kong and Asia, uh, there were people who said, do we really need this? Is, is Hong Kong ready for that? Um, and as you probably know, when we started the bidding five years ago, we were bidding against 17 other cities, um, including Los Angeles, San Francisco, uh, Washington DC and, and Guadalajara. Uh, and part of the bidding process, we, we finally got a shortlisted against Washington DC in Guadalajara. Four years ago, we organized a site visit inspection from the inspectors. We organized a big reception at PMQ where 600 people came up from the whole community. And um, so all along this journey, they always have people say, do we really need this? Are people concerned? 
But I think that's also the purpose of the gay games to have those dialogues and to explain people what is the event about and also bring the hearts and minds in a very positive way, right? Because sport is universal. Uh, if we all go, all of us tonight for run together, yeah, somebody falls, somebody has cramps, we're really able to build lifelong friendships. And I think once you talk with the people who maybe have questions about this and they understand the concept, so far everybody has been very supportive and, and we really believe in the unity element there. Uh, so that's the first uh, question. And then 21, 21, venues. 21 venues. So those venues include private venues, like for example, the rugby union, who has King Park uh, available, but also so sailing will be taking place in Haby Haven in Sai Kung, uh, and then also, for example, here in uh, Victoria Harbor. Uh, then there will be other locations for, for running, which will take place uh, outdoor uh, in different locations. One will be a, a running event taken in Sai Kung, then the other one will be in Taipo, uh, and the other one will be here around the peak, for example. Um, so the different locations, either private or government AFCD venues, that you can uh, secure closer to date. That's a question about the transgender. I'll take that after you. Yeah, yeah after you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 嗯, 呃, 其實跨性別群組那方面呢, 我們都一路有, 呃, 是有很多聯絡的, 我們也在這方面都有跟政府去溝通過, 不是只是這個議員的男和女的分別更容易去接受呃, love to take it because we just actually launched a study about um, it's the largest scale study of transgender in uh, people in in Hong Kong back in May. 我們那個study是有 可以用到一個跟他們自己性別認同有關的match的一個洗手間的 咁而亦都我哋有一啲數字呢，係講關於誒佢哋去面對誒入境時候嘅嘅嘅一個問題嘅，而我就喺度抄緊嘅。咁咧就係見得到咧，其實都有誒好多嘅受訪者咧，係
誒、呃、去為跨性別人士嚟到香港提供嗰個便利，同埋令到佢哋覺得舒服。其實有好多層面都需要諗，譬如係、呃、酒店嘅一啲、呃、登記嘅時間啦，究竟係咪仲係用緊一啲好二元嘅嘅性別去 assume 嚟緊會去佢去接待嗰一個？顧客啦，又亦都係即係成個社會嗰個 mindset， 其實係咪都應該有一個相應嘅改變，係令到小眾都覺得係佢哋會覺得舒服嘅咧？咁而我覺得即係今日因為係一個五百日嘅日子咧，其實即係話長話話長又唔長，話短又唔短嘅時間咧，其實係應該無論政府啊、相關部門啊，同埋即係成個誒唔、呃、同嘅服務提供者都需要去諗嘅一個問題。Thank you. Thank you. We have time for a couple more questions. Yeah, I allow me to ask in Chinese. So, uh, some students have mentioned that there are some people who have a hard time reading. So, this one is not very easy. Some students have some difficulty reading. 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 嘅評擊咧，同埋即係其實當誒誒基因樹嚟競品嘅時候，會唔會即係都會遇到更加多呢一啲呢一類型嘅批評？咁而你哋又會點樣去處理啊？或者去即係點樣誒、呃？即係做多所有嘅評擊嘅嘗試，係唔係另外就係即係都想問翻係即係個範啊？咁就因為今次基因樹係第一次喺亞洲嘅地區舉行，咁其實同誒其他。地方即係譬如可能配套上啊，大家成個社會嘅氛圍上，其實都有啲嘅唔同喺度。咁誒，咁今一次即係亞洲舉行，會遇到啲乜嘢特別嘅誒困難咧？而一啲困難又即係未來五百之內，係會點樣去解決咧？是的。Her first question is about,、uh, you know, whether we have anticipated. I mean, of course, with the recent incidents and the negative comments, you know, do we anticipate there'll be more negative、uh, comments and feedback from from the groups or from the community at large? And what would be our response, right? And then the second question is, you know,、uh, this is the first time, you know, the Gay Games coming to Asia. You know, what kind of challenges we might expect or experience, and how we're planning to address those challenges. Uh, for for the games coming into Asia, right? So、uh, maybe I can first answer the the first question. 用用廣東話係嘛？我簡單啲。咁其實咧，即係誒上幾個禮拜嗰啲誒，即係議員嘅言論啊。咁我哋當然都係明白到喺呢個社會入邊係有唔同嘅聲音啦。咁正正係因為咁樣嘅原因，所以其實先社會係多元，係咪？咁我哋其實誒、呃，我聽到呢啲聲音之後，其實。誒當然初初係有少少即係係唔開心啦，係咪？咁但係其實亦都靜咗落嚟之後，其實係令我更加覺得點解我哋需要將同樂運動會帶到嚟香港，而且喺呢幾個禮拜之後咧，我哋係得到喺社會上嘅無論係誒社區嘅朋友又好啊，或者喺一啲圈裏邊嘅朋友又好啊，佢哋都好積極咁樣嚟話：，誒、哎、我有咩可以幫你啊？誒、呃、有錢出錢，有力出力咁樣。其實喺某程度上係令到我哋係。更加鼓舞咯，更加知道其實我哋所做嘅嘢係啱嘅，我哋點樣可以即係即係要好好咁不負眾望咁樣去將呢件事情出年係做好咁樣。咁當然其實誒喺、呃、社會入邊有唔同嘅聲音係係誒係正常嘅，係咪係正常嘅？咁所以我哋係亦都預期咗係會有唔同嘅聲音，但係我哋就希望可以點樣我哋做得更好，去作為一個溝通渠道，可以令到係誒即係大家起碼一個對話，因為其實同樂運動會只係一個開始。咁將來我哋點樣可以繼續喺呢個社區裏邊去推廣呢個多元種嘅團團結？呢、这個先係最重要嘅信息咯。啊，咁關於你話亞洲誒，即、呃、係第一次亞洲舉辦，咁或者我呢個講少少咁，如果誒誒誒 ，maybe maybe I'll use English so that just in case Dennis wants to supplement, you know. So the first time in Asia, I I think there are、uh, some components of it, you know, that would be a little bit more、uh, challenge in a sense because a lot of the Participants, they don't even. A lot of people don't even know what the gay games is, right? So actually, we have to explain to them what the games is about, and、uh, and just telling them, you know, that this is open to everyone, and you know, why can they join even if they're not sporty? All those questions, because in Europe and America, people already know about it already, and 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 that was not an issue, right? And then some part of it is also because the games are primarily, you know, perhaps um uh is been always been hosted. 
in Western countries. So some of the games, we do need to make a little bit of adjustments and maybe introducing new elements to make it more suitable for, for Hong Kong, right? Or for Asia. Like that's why we're introducing like, you know, Dragon Ball, trail running, those kind of events that we thought will be more relevant, you know, to our participants here in Asia. So those are some of the things that uh, we will do. Maybe Dennis, you want to yeah. add? Thank you. Uh, thank you for asking the question. So, yes, yeah, so the key thing is, like, like Lisa said, right, most of the people in Asia have never heard about the gay games. So part of our international outreach is really going into the communities in Cambodia, the Philippines, the mainland China, and go to the sports organizations. Uh, and often it's just a small groups of people uh, and, and telling them about the gay games and how they can learn about it. Uh, there's an interesting story, actually, to tell about this. So when we won the gay games bid in 2017, and that was all over the media and all the news. And, and there was also a person, she was, her name is Meng, and she read it in the news and she lives in Maine in China. And she said, wow, this is such a great event. I want to participate. So she started a basketball uh, team and with her basketball team, she participated in the gay games in Paris. So slowly now, and we're still in contact with her. So she now is preparing and, and training with her team to participate at the gay games. And the key thing is really to go into those communities explaining what the event is about, so people will get engaged. Could I make a very quick point? That that I also want to add that I think uh, because sometimes like there is a lot of debate about whether being LGBT plus is a non-Asian thing, but I also want to actually emphasize that Asia is also rapidly changing as well. Say, for example, that um, in although some parts of Asia were not as well prepared, but you see that Taiwan has become the first jurisdiction that has legalized same-sex marriage in Japan in the lead up to the Olympics, that there has also been a lot of debate about um, LGBT plus friendliness, both in the private sector, as well as uh, by the government. And also there has a, been a lot of debate in other parts like um, Thailand, Philippines, uh, 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 on different ways of uh, protection of LGBT plus people. So I think we also like, need to debunk that, oh, necessarily that uh, that is going to be held in Asia. People are not going to accept it. I think there are indeed going to be challenges, but then we must also debunk the myth that, oh, being LGBT plus is uh, somehow against Asia in, in, in a way. Asia is also very rapidly changing as well. Yeah. Great, thank you, thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Does anyone have any, any more questions? All right, so if there are no more questions, we would like to formally thank everybody for spending your time with us today at this press briefing. We will place online all of the press materials, including the fact sheets, the PowerPoint presentations, uh, there's actually a trove of very valuable information on the Press Center site for the Gay Games, which is at uh, ggHk2022.com. You will also find uh, the economic impact study that Dennis mentioned as well. And uh, you will also find contacts for uh, press inquiries and so on. So please feel free to browse the Press Center. And we will also be emailing out the press release to all of you today. So we thank you very much for your time and we look forward to seeing you at the next briefing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you.